great. I recognize a couple of faces anyway. Um, so, firstly, thanks for Justy, because this is brilliant that this is all set up and the pizza's from Justy and this screen is Justy and beers are Justy, so that's brilliant. <laughs> There um, are going to be a few Just Eat representatives who will have their lanyards on. If you work with chatbots, coding them, that is, uh, and you would like to talk to someone who might be hiring people who work with chatbots, then get in contact with one of these people with lanyards on. So today, we've got four great speakers, three great sessions. That does not mean we've got one rubbish session. It means that one of those sessions has two speakers, just in case the maths was confusing. Uh, and now the clicker doesn't work, so I'm going to go over here and do that. Just general stuff. Um, if there is a fire alarm, I'm sure there won't be. Run screaming in circles, probably smaller ones, and will form an infinite mass and zero volume in black hole. Or we can use the fire exits around the back. Lose our round behind the lifts. Wi-Fi is there and distributed around the seats because connectivity here is a bit weird. We should have enough time after each session for some questions. Uh, we'll be throwing around this thing, so duck and speak clearly into it so everyone can hear. Sharing is caring. So if you could do um, tweeting and things, that would be nice to make it look like we're important. I'd love that. Thank you. So first up is this guy with, uh, with uh, handing over to humans then. Let's see if I can now get back to what you were doing. Yay. Excellent. Thanks, Robin. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Dalton. I'm a Microsoft technical evangelist. I've been working with the bot framework for the last, well, about 18 months, ever since it was announced at Build 2016. Uh, I'm actually here, and I'm, we're quite lucky in that we've got a couple of my colleagues here as well. So, Simon, if you just want to put your hand up, and Tommy. Um, so, if you've got any questions about any of this session or any Microsoft-related bot framework stuff, then just grab us after the session. But uh, Robin approached me and asked me to talk about this uh, particular topic for the bot framework. It is actually quite interesting for uh, customer service scenarios. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have built bots before or you're pretty aware of the bot framework. So, there is a bit of a gap in our, our tooling at the moment with how do you support a conversation handing off over to a human. So uh, we've got a brainchild in our group uh, that is Tommy uh, that started this little project and it's become a bit of a labor of love. Uh, and so we've been working on that for the past few months. And I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about how it works uh, today. So um, Tommy set up this message routing um, project. And it's all about like how we could get two individuals that are actually using different channels, when I say channels, that could be Slack, could be Facebook, that don't actually know each other, how could we actually use the bot framework to kind of like be the middle man and pass messages uh, between two completely different um, messenger channels. So as I sort of like just talk through this in that if we know, if we've got say uh, a bot down here called Bob the Bot and we've got Alice and we've got Rob over here, Alice knows the bot, and she obviously knows her friends, uh, and she could be using some channel, say Slack. Then we've got, um, what do I call him, Robin? I can't remember, thanks. Uh, he, kn he, he knows the bot, so he's added the bot into his contact list, and he's got all of his uh, friends as well. And then we've got the bot that actually knows both of these, um, Alice and Robin. But the important information is what we actually get from the bot framework itself. This is actually how we know uh, who a user is on a given channel. This is the data that we get out of the bot framework. So by using this uh, as effectively um, a directory lookup, we can actually then start to build up a picture of Alice is on a given channel, say Slack, and we know that her identity is Alice at whatever it is. And then we've got uh, Robin over here that maybe using Facebook Messenger. He's using a completely different channel, uh, but we know his identity on that channel. And if effectively, we have a lookup within our own uh, bot. We can then start to do interesting things. But they're on two different channels, and there's no way that they can route messages directly to each other. But they do both know the bot. 
So we can then use the bot as the middleman effectively. And the message routing pattern that, that, that Tommy came up with is the fact that we've got this message routing manager and it has a concept of parties and a party is basically anyone that's in conversation with someone else. And that is kind of how we're then able to kind of match up and see who's talking to who. And there's a bunch of messaging utils. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, there's a source repo that I'll point you to and you can kind of go off and look at the full implementation of this. But to look at this um, in, a, in a different way, uh, and, I, and I kind of put this slide together because it, it kind of really hammers home wh what a bot handoff is. So the message routing pattern is actually just a middleman that could connect two completely uh, unknown entities to each other, as long as they both know the same bot. But what the bot handoff is, is all about really orchestrating a conversation. Uh, so when the user gets stuck, the bot can then, uh, the human can then take over um, under the sort of like the image of the bot. So it looks like the bot is actually still typing the response, but it is actually a human. So it's actually quite interesting. Uh, if any of you have used Facebook Messenger, you can kind of do this already if you've got a bot in that you can see all the responses that are going to and from the users, and you can actually then inject and type in your own responses uh, over the top of whatever the bot's doing anyway. So here's a scenario. So we've got um, our human called Dave, and he's uh, talking to the flight bot, and effectively what he wants to do is book some travel. So if any of you have seen the Skyscanner bot, this is kind of the scenario that it's based on, in that uh, the Skyscanner bot, it will ask you where you want to go, uh, what date you want to leave, how many are in the party, etc. But then what happens if you've got like a special case scenario where the bot, com you know, the bot just wouldn't be coded for those kind of edge scenarios, it just wouldn't make sense. So here, um, the bot starts off in its normal kind of conversation. It says, hi, I'm Flightbot, how can I help you today? Dave says, I'm looking for flights to Vegas. And the Flightbot replies, sure, when do you want to travel? And Dave says, look, I've got some special ass. I just want to talk to a human. There's no point in talking me or navigating me through this wizard doing get data capture because I know that I've got some specific ass. So at that point, we could actually leave Dave to it and like, you know, let him sort of fend for himself. Or we could actually inject uh, the flight um, bot handoff to human code. And at which case, if we've then got a call center and we've got Colin over here that's monitoring that call center, he can then pick up the fact that Dave is stuck. He'll see the context of the um, conversation so far, and he'll then be able to start typing responses on behalf of Flightbot. At this point, then it turns into a, a Turing test because Dave then isn't, you know, he can't believe he's talking to a real human or not. Uh, so he'll then probably start asking probing questions, are you a real person? And Colin then says, of course I am. I'm here to help you with your travel to Las Vegas. And Dave says, great, well, I'm actually looking to do a stag do uh, with lots of people, and hence why I've got some special requests for that. So that's kind of the scenario. Hopefully that kind of makes sense to, to most of you. Um, what I'll do now is kind of talk you through, um, actually, I'll, I'll just show you a demo of this in action. Let's hope the demo gods are with us. Can you see that? Okay, is that a bit... Do you want me to make it a little bit bigger? I'm not going to go through the code um, in mass detail, but uh, effectively, there's two components to it. There's the, the bot message routing, uh, which is the actual framework, the, the, the bit that's doing all the grunt work behind the scenes with the uh, matching up parties to each other. Uh, that's now uh, implemented as a NuGet package, so you can just pull that into your bot framework um, code base and then actually start hooking into it. But what we've also got is a, a sample project that actually uses this NuGet package uh, and, and kind of shows you how you could implement uh, kind of some human handoff scenarios. So that's what I'm gonna show you working now. Now the key thing we're here with uh, sort of like bot handoff in that there's actually kind of two scenarios. Uh, one of the scenarios is whereby anyone on any channel could register themselves as the agent or the supervisor. Um, and then that means that they're then ready to pick up any requests for a human from any other given channel. So let's show you that in action. So uh, my sample bot is running. I'm gonna go to the emulator, just connect to this guy. Just gonna make sure it's working by saying hi. 
So at the moment, we just echo out the fact that, you know, let me just move that window a little bit so you can see it a little bit clearer. There you go. Uh, and then I'm going to go over to, let's do Skype. Oh, just type any old stuff to Skype. And we can see that that's responding as well. So let's just move that up so it's not in the crosshairs of your screens. Now, we've added some custom commands in here to actually register yourself as the, the agent. So I could do that on any channel. So let's use um, Skype in this example. So if I do command watch, and you can override these uh, commands. So this says that your channel uh, is now, or conversations are now being aggregated within Skype. So if I now go over to uh, the emulator and I say human, you can see that my request has been sent to Skype. Let's just put that back there. And the operator, i.e. the agent, can now determine whether or not they want to accept or reject this request for assistance. So if I'm feeling particularly friendly today, I might say accept. And then we get an error. Excellent. OK, let's see if this works. So your request was accepted, I'm now chatting with. Now, there is a bug at the moment in that we're not getting the username from, uh, from Skype come through properly. Uh, we're actively working on that. So let's say uh, hello. And you can see that hello is now being moderated and uh, it's coming through to Skype. Let's see if we can go back. Ah, okay. I'm going to use Slack instead. So I'm going to register the agent uh, on Slack. So this will now become the aggregation channel. So if I now put that request in for a human again, the request comes through to Slack. I accept. It's not looking healthy, is it? You're connected to user. Let's try that. Hello from emulator. So you can see the emulator's picked up. Uh, hello from emulator, and we should be able to say uh, hi from admin. And you can see that's going two ways. So we've now got the, um, the administrator or the agent, supervisor, whatever you want to call them, working on behalf of the bot and being able to you know, drive the customer through the rest of their journey uh, within the conversation. So this is what we call scenario one. So it's a uh, channel to channel, which is great for kind of like one on one, -on -one um, aggregation for, for one channel. But that's not really scalable if you're running a call center and you've got potentially hundreds of users uh, hitting your bot and you need to moderate all of those conversations. So this is kind of uh, where it starts to get interesting. So if I'm just gonna stop this a second. And what one of our colleagues uh, in the States, Bill Barnes, wrote is a, an, an agent that effectively um, is a, a little node app that, that runs and it polls um, the bot framework to see if there's any messages uh, for it. So if I just run this, uh, npm uh, start run. The actual code base for this is tiny. It's, it's literally what you're seeing here. Uh, the important things to set are your NGROC location. I've got a blog post on how to set all this up and walk through uh, along with some corresponding videos as well. Um, so assuming that that is now running, if I now go to my bot and just run the bot. The important thing here is that uh, within your bot, it will actually pull in a, another controller, an agent controller. Now this is what the agent, that node little app that you just saw, actually polls this guy to make sure if there's any messages for it. So you, this is why you'll, you'll notice that we've got calls enabled to allow the, the two different um, endpoints to, to reach each other. So if I now go to here and go to 8080,
try that again. So we've got the agent UI working here, and then I'm going to, uh, we've got the bot obviously working. So if I go to the emulator, and I, uh, I just start a new conversation, and I say, I need a human. You'll notice that we get a little web chat pops up in the, in the background on our administration portal. And I can say, hey, how can I help you? And you can see that that's working to the emulator OK. This is where it starts to get uh, quite interesting. So if I now go back to Slack and say, um, I need a human too. Notice so we get another little pop-up. Uh, so this has now put us in touch with um, my user on the Slack channel. So I could say, hey, user in Slack, what's up? And again, that should go two-way. Two we can see the message has come through. Now, just to take this a little bit further, I could then go into Skype. And say, give me a human. And then we get another window pop up. You kind of get the idea of where this is going. And we can see we've got two way comms going between the two. And then finally, I could then go over to, let's see if I can do this one, Facebook. If we go back to here, and you can see that that message is again working two way. So here you kind of get the feel for how that comms can work and how it could actually scale and support, uh, a, you know, a whole bunch of conversations all taking place at the same time. So I've got a couple of URLs for you. I can share this deck, and then you'll be able to get them, or I'll give them to Robin, and you can distribute however. Um, here's some useful links. Effectively, um, a blog post uh, that's got some videos on it that show pretty much what I've gone through now. Uh, at the top one, we've got actual Tommy's uh, GitHub repo. We will accept like pull requests. If you do want to contribute, we'd love that. It'd be great. Uh, we've got people actively you know, raising bugs and you know, helping us troubleshoot, which is great. Um, Tommy's got his own post and blog post that talks a bit about um, some of the, the background into how he built the framework and, and some of the terminology that's used. And then there's a great Channel 9 video that kind of talks through um, this um, because there's a Node implementation as well. So I've only talked about the C-sharp one today, but if you're Node junkies, then there, there's a solution to that too. So that's pretty much it. Any questions? Stun silence. Yep. 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 So that is actually uh, up to you how you implement it. It's that's configurable, effectively. So here. It really determines on whether you want to keep the, con the user in the context of the conversation with the bot. So it's the bot that's self, you know, servient effectively, that's, that's you know, getting all the answers for the user and is that man in the middle. Do you want to keep the bot persona doing that or do you actually want to say, no, I'm now handing you over to a human and make it really obvious that they're actually talking to you know, Colin and customer services. That's entirely up to you how you, how you want to implement this. Uh, but, You have to be certain that 
to do us a favor and speak to the boss. <laughs> yeah, so the hard part's the context transfer. Um, that's the case for any channel. It's why it's really difficult in text, but all the other channels that it's possible to, con to transfer the context. So you need, you need, you need an identification token yep. to transfer to make sure that both parties, especially the agent knows that's a valid transfer. And that's, that's the difficult bit. Right. Which is kind of the bit that I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So the, the concern is that someone could spoof the user. When you used to call up, right. call up your bank, yep. to transfer it to somebody else, okay. they'd ask you all the same questions. Okay, again. gotcha. Yep. Nowadays they don't need to yep. because somebody has worked out how to transfer the context. Yep. The next agent gets all the context, knows that you've passed security. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to get asked the same, same stuff. Um, to be honest, I've not had that question come in in the context of this. Um, I guess it's still pretty early days in this implementation. I don't know, Tom, have you seen that? So, so the, the question is, is that you've already logged in to say Skype or Slack or whatever. <coughs> Slack knows who you are. If you then hand over to uh, our, our agent, yeah. How does the agent guarantee that that is the actual user that says that they're from Slack or do you rely on the Facebook ID or the Slack channel ID? The library itself doesn't really care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And for more sophisticated customer service scenarios, you could, for instance, this is a bit aside of the point, you could uh, record the conversation that has happened with the bot. So the customer agent could already know what the situation is about. Uh, yeah, the, the, basically what the library just does is to, it collects the, the identities of the users it sees, plus the, the identities of the bot itself also has different identities on different channels. And it collects the sort of the phone book. So it just allows you to connect between those uh, people within different channels, spots. It's not doing any channels. additional validation. It's assuming that the you know the user is already authenticated on their channel, right? Yeah, it's, it's just a generic library that you can use built uh, on top of, and it's versatile. You can use it even for notifications, proactive messaging, stuff like that. This is just one of the use cases. Do you use custom bot state in there somewhere to um, store the credentials as they've logged into let's the originating channel and then pick them up again when they you don't when get they access the other to one, their or we won't have access to that to their credentials or would it be an extension to the directory maybe? Yeah, I, I don't think you could do that mm. in, in the fact that you you only know uh, who the user is in the channel that are on. You not you don't get access to mm. any of their access tokens against Slack or, or whatever like that, because uh, that would be a security risk, right? Um, yeah. Next question. Yeah, I was just wondering sort of the um, the uptake in Microsoft to push this more forward because, like where I work, where you have you've got nuance and uh, live chat there where. If, if you're talking to a bot, then you can go off to an agent in the back end. So I just wondered, as the bot framework gets bigger, is there a bigger push for this, or is it still a proof of concept type stage? Well, this is, this is uh, I'd say it's beyond proof of concept, because we've got a library, we've got a package, NuGet package that's out there now that you can go and consume, and it's, it works. Yeah. Um, it's just a case of how you want to implement it. Um, I've done some stuff with IVR as well, around sort of um, audio uh, recordings. Uh, I've not looked at doing... <laughs> implementation with that against handing off to human that could be an, another interesting scenario to kind of explore but right now the bot framework team are concentrating on just getting ga so general available uh, avail availability past uh, you know the preview that is in at the moment so that's kind of where all our efforts are in and i think after that then we might start to see some of these nice kind of uh, scenarios cool thank you Yeah, I'm thinking about like different use cases here. If you've got new staff uh, that are taking on calls, they could hand over to a more experienced person. That could be a use case. Yep. And maybe if you've got an unhappy customer, you could hand off back to the bot that specializes in customer 
reassurance. Uh, the until, pot. Un, un, yeah. until the caring pot has yeah. made the person care, and then it can come back to the user again. Yeah. So uh, what ultimately what you want to get to is a, a self-learning bot, right? So if a human has to intervene because the question wasn't handled by the bot, why not, like, whatever the, the human does, whatever responses they give, why not add that to the knowledge bank of the bot itself so that the next time that question comes up, uh, you don't have to even do a handoff. Um, so at the moment here, what you've seen is the human specifically asked for a human. Uh, sorry, yeah, the user specifically asked for a human assistant, right? Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't actually instantiate this process if, for example, you hit a Q&A database and the answer wasn't found, then automatically route them to a human. The human then adds the reply and at the same time adds it to the knowledge bank. Uh, so the next time that question comes up, you don't need that handoff at all. And again, that's an another interesting pattern that would be you know, pretty easy to implement with what we've got here. I, I have it. I have it. The graph is keeping going, kind of flipped from there to that one. The agent UI bit. When I saw that in the video, I was like, I know, it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it is awesome. Yeah. Right. Sure. Um, the UI where you get all these accumulated of chats coming in asking for a human, that you said that that's not to be Huh? Yeah, the clicker worked, the clicker worked. Okay, that whole tech thing actually worked a lot quicker than I was expecting, so sit down. <coughs> um, right, so that was what you just saw. If you have questions, send them that way. That was cool, thank you very much. Um, this is me, that's my face, that's my Twitter, that's where I blog when I think of interesting things to say, and since I've been messing around with the cognitive services a bit more recently, there's a lot more interesting stuff coming up, so you should check that one out. It's kind of good fun, actually. Um, I am going to have a chat about the speaker recognition API, which is pretty, I find it pretty impressive. Recently, it seems that Microsoft have really been kind of ramping up their AI and machine learning that all kind of falls under this, this uh, cognitive services grouping, the name. There's some incredible offerings there, the kind of things that you'd only be able to get if you had, uh, I don't know, um, a PhD in maths and you knew how to write Python and R. And this is really complex stuff, not just your bog standard engineer writing a bit of code for a website. This is image processing, identifying what's in images, identifying sentiment of a bit of text, um, analyzing speech patterns, analyzing real-time video. This is incredible stuff. And to be able to just ping a couple of APIs <coughs> and get that stuff means you can now build some incredibly clever things. What I'm going to show you is not incredibly clever, but it's a bit of a laugh. 
Um, so they fall under, the cognitive services kind of fall under these main headings. There is another one, but it's basically Bing is an API, and I, I'm not going to talk about that. The vision one is all of the image processing, the uh, algorithms to try and describe and analyze the contents of images. Knowledge one is incredibly cool. It's basically machine learning as a service. You've got complex, uh, you can kind of get lots of complex information, you can give it lots of complex information, lots of different services in there to try and get understandings out of vast amounts of data, which is incredibly cool. The language one is more around trying to understand, uh, say, the intent of a piece of text or the meaning of a long piece of text or some other stuff, such as trying to understand what users would want. The speech one is incredibly cool. Like being able to do real-time translation, being able to um, give real-time subtitles. I don't know if you've seen any of the Build or other Microsoft, like Future Decoded or something like this, where you've got subtitles just appearing potentially in another language. It's just all hitting these incredibly cool APIs. And the fact that you can just do this quite easily, just by hitting an endpoint, is very, very cool. The vision ones, fall on, uh, these are the main ones. A lot of these should have big preview stickers on them. And there's a good reason for that. They don't, they're not entirely stable, but they're brilliant. So the computer vision one is, uh, here's an image, what's in the image? And this is, I find this brilliant. Just the fact that you can very easily do this. I've got a, like a demo chatbot where you can send it an image and it'll give you back a bunch of hashtags because I'm rubbish at Instagram and I want something else to figure it out for me. They're not always accurate, but it's quite cool. The face API within a picture works out where the faces are the age and gender of that person and whether maybe they're feeling happy or not using the emotion API. This is incredibly clever stuff, right? And then the custom vision service. So difference between custom vision and computer vision. Computer vision, if, I took a, if you were to take a picture of this, it would be, I don't know, man standing presentation. If you worked for an e-commerce company and you trained it with your product catalog, it would be, Lou, crew neck, long sleeve, merino wool sweater, or something like that. You get a much more descriptive um, description. That's more specific to your use case. Very, very clever stuff. The video indexer, if you get time, go and check that out. It's utterly incredible. You'll I'll upload, you give it a piece of video, it'll give you the, um, the text of what someone is saying, the keywords from what they're saying, the uh, try and do facial recognition to work out who is speaking, uh, the sentiment, whether they're, they seem happy or not as they're talking. It's just amazing the kind of insights you can get from this. So if you're doing any kind of video processing, that is a very cool one to play around with. Now this demo, I'm not going to show this whole thing. This is a couple of years old now. Uh, let me go back over here so I'm not facing the speaker. Uh, this has not gone to the start of it. There's a guy, a Microsoft developer, called um, Saqib Sheikh, who developed this incredible app that has now been extended. He developed it, it was maybe like early 2016 or something, so it's nearly two years old. And it's now, if you go to seeingai.com, you can see literally what, what is created. Um, and I'm just gonna show a little bit about this far in. And you never know. I see two faces, 40-year-old man with a beard looking surprised, 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. So it can describe just, so he's built this thing into a pair of glasses that with a swipe, it'll kind of explain what's happening around him. The fact that you could be in this meeting with people and not sure if they've understood what he said and just with a swipe, it's like this person is looking confused. Brilliant. I'll just explain that again. These people look happy. This is amazing. And uh, seeing AI is, uh, you can now, there's another video on there which kind of shows where this app has got to and how you can just kind of walk around with a phone and it'll be describing and reading and explaining what's around you. I mean, this is the kind of cool stuff that we can be playing with now. Seeing AI came out last week in the UK. Go and get it, Seeing AI. It's, it is very, very cool. So this was the little Instagram bot. It's not worth following me, but should you want to check the kind of tags that, that appear. Uh, I only joined Instagram because I wanted to test out 
Microsoft Cognitive Services image recognition. I have no idea about doing hashtags, but so here's a picture. That's my daughter in a boat on a lake in Myanmar, and it came up with water, outdoor, river, green, boat, sitting. They're all really good, right? I mean, but then it does get down to eating cake, birthday, riding, standing. Like, ah, not so good. But again, the responses you get. So this is like, this is everything that I think I can see in the image. Don't worry about the, my confidence in that. The short list are things like, I'm pretty confident about these. So it's water, sky, outdoor, river, green, lake. Not bad. If it had chucked in boat, that would have been good. You can also get the dominant colors within the image. So you've got gray and green. That's pretty good going. So basically, I've got a, a, a bot connected to Skype that I'll send an image to whilst I'm faffing around with Instagram. It will give me the hashtags back. I'll copy and paste them over. That was easy. And that's like you're, you're paying you know, per 10,000 images or something. This is, it's not incredibly expensive stuff. It's very, very cool. The knowledge-based ones, again, it's like machine learning as a service. This is crazy, crazy cool stuff. The fact that, so recommendations API is about to be uh, deprecated. It'll become this uh, one-click deploy solution for giving your customers personalized recommendations, so personalized content. The kind of thing that entire companies exist just to do this, you can do one-click deploy into Azure, and it, it, you've got like a couple of algorithms that will help you out. Utterly amazing that you've got this. A lot of the other ones are there. I don't really understand them because they're all very quite complicated, but that one was amazing. And the uh, kind of language processing ones, if you've done any work with uh, the bot framework, you've probably had a play with the uh, Lewis top left language understanding intelligence service where you give it a piece of text, an utterance, and it will look at your trained model and go, this was the intent of that piece of text. Uh, uh, I'm hungry, where's my food? It's like a standard thing within Just Eat, and it would go to the intent of late order. And then you can deal with, ah, oh, that person has a late order, I can deal with that. But the text analytics one is incredible. You could give it like a huge amount of text. Like it's not a uh, request response kind of thing. It's a, here's a whole load of content. I'll get back to you later, and you tell me a summary of that content. But, Whoa, I don't have to read books anymore. Just go, <clears throat> off you go, tell me what it's about. This is, that's amazing. And the translator, like, just being able to do this stuff. The speech stuff, this one, the translator speech API, just kind of real-time speech translation. This is amazing. This is future stuff. Very, very cool. And the custom speech service, similar to how the custom vision service was man standing becomes product. It's uh, if we were talking about .NET and... I don't know, bot framework, these might not get handled and transcribed by the more generic speech service, so you can train a model with very specific terms for your, um, your kind of domain. Very, very cool stuff. So the thing that I'm going to talk about is a speaker recognition API, which uh, comes in kind of two flavors. You've got verification and you've got identification. Um, where are oh, There we go. That's exactly what I just said. Brilliant. The first API, the speaker verification one, um, is kind of meant to be used as a type of uh, login or authentication where you can, by having a user read for, uh, or repeat a key phrase a few times, you can be pretty sure that you have their voice print. And the next time they say that phrase, you can have a high degree of confidence that that is that person that they're talking about. I mean, they literally, you know literally who they say they are. Very, very cool stuff. Um, I mean, could this be the end? No, not really. Could this be the end of the password? That one word that you tend to use that is just complex enough to pass validation that starts with a capital letter and ends with a number and an exclamation mark and you increment that number every time you're told to update your password. I can see everyone's doing that, yeah. And if you're not willing to use something like LastPass or one password, which is a little bit techy, a little bit tricky, then maybe we could hook in something a bit more user-friendly where someone tries to log in and they just say a phrase and we know it's them for sure, right? I mean, that would be very cool. Now, did anyone notice from that drop-down, my voice is my passport, verify me. Does anyone recognize this? Does anyone know this? Hi, my name is Werner Brandes. My voice is my passport, verify me. Sneakers, yeah. It's this brilliant, well, I think it's brilliant, brilliant 90s hacker movie 
which um, is kind of trolling the whole concept of uh, speaker verification based on their voice, because this guy manages to do this. You are clear all the way up to the mandrel. Very secure system. Just like that. So surely this can't be a very secure thing if, it, that, if that's even in the drop down. However, I have tried it with a recording and it doesn't actually work. You can have a play around with this. There is a demo um, that so long as you get your own API key, then you'll be fine. Even though Google Trusted Voice says someone with a similar voice or recording of a voice could unlock your device. So maybe they're just not doing it properly. I don't know. But I haven't really tested it that well. Maybe, maybe it's not as incredibly secure. Um, so, should you want to go and set it up yourself, pretty easy. If you go to your Azure dashboard, you go new, AI cognitive services, and you have to search because it just doesn't kind of appear in the drop down. And once you've created that, you end up with a pretty familiar, if you mess around with Azure, pretty familiar kind of uh, screen where you can get your access keys from a couple of places, and we're going to use that in a moment. Because to implement verification, it's only a couple of steps. It's like a couple, two or three API calls. Very simple. You create a profile, which is uh, kind of like, I want a new entry in a database, um, and then enroll that profile. So for this entry, here is a voice print. And I want you to use that voice print for that profile. Very simple stuff. This, ignore the fact that I'm using JavaScript. I'm just trying to show how incredibly simple this is. And it is, in fact, it works all in one like HTML page, the fact that you can do this, where we're just hitting one endpoint of verification profiles with our cognitive services key and we would expect to get back a response that contains a verification profile ID. So this is initially kind of set up. I want to create a new profile and you just get back something like that. Brilliant. I have a new profile. Next up, we're going to try and enroll that with, um, with some audio and have a voice print. Actually, but before we do that, so which phrases can we use? Wouldn't it be cool to be able to set it up to, to have people enroll in your system and have to say, Robin is cool, Robin is cool, Robin is cool, three times, or I'm an idiot. Unfortunately, you can't, there, but there is an endpoint where you can work out which phrases are valid. And if you don't say one of these phrases, then the, ver the uh, verification doesn't work. It's these ones. I'm gonna make a monopoly, can't refuse, Houston, we have had a problem, yada, yada, yada. But there is, my voice is my passport, verify me, so. Unfortunately, no Rick Astley lyrics or anything. Wouldn't that be great? Have someone to log into a banking system? Never going to give you up. Never going to give you up. I love that. Um, now that we know the phrase that we're allowed to use and we've got a profile ID, it's simply a case of doing a post to the verification profiles with that profile ID and some audio that's encoded in the correct way. Now, out of all of this stuff that I've done, and you'll see a demo that all of this works, Getting that in the right format was the hardest thing to do in a web browser. It's horrific. But the response that you get after you've done an enrollment is initially something like this. It'll say, um, it's been accepted. The phrase you said was, my voice is my passport, verify me. Uh, one of them has succeeded. I need two more. So you have to repeat this three times. And then it's a case of, OK, I've got a, a good enough voice print for that profile, carry on. And then it ends up looking a bit more like that. It's like, this is enrolled, three enrollments, I don't need any more, all good. Now that we've got the profile set up, here's how we do the, the I guess, the verification. Again, really complicated stuff. It's a case of, there's uh, the verify endpoint. I wanna give you the, this particular profile ID, and I want you to compare it to this voice print. So, I think I'm talking to this person. Go and compare it and tell me if it's them. 
And if it is, you get one at the top where the match was uh, uh, valid, I guess, was a degree of confidence. It's either low, normal, or high. And if for any reason it didn't match, so it's a different voice, you didn't say the right thing, I mean, you didn't say anything, um, it'll come back as a rejection. So let's see if this at all works. Actually, hold on, I need to get the key from my speaker notes. Okay, do that. I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna get, there's no point remembering this service key. I'm gonna change it. So if you go to this, to the, that uh, particular link, it'll be in the slide. There is a working demo of all of this. You just need to go and get your Cognitive Services API key, whack it in there, hit go, and you get this beautiful page. You can tell I'm a UI guy. And what we're going to do, so I'm going to try and en enroll for verification. Let's see, so I'll hit that, and it should say, oh, God. Okay, that didn't, because I was talking rubbish at the same time. I thought it would ask me for permissions. My voice is my passport. Verify me. Thinking about it. Okay, so enrolling, it got one, it needs two more. You can get really sick of me saying this, but I'm going to keep saying it, unfortunately. My voice is my passport, verify me. Cool, okay, two. One more time, hopefully. My voice is my passport, verify me. Okay, verification should be enabled. And no, I'm not going to play it, but that's, that's just good for testing it out. You can, you can see what was actually recorded. So now if I want to verify, hmm, it's a little bit big. Can we zoom out a bit? Anyway, uh, banana, 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 banana. We've got a rejection. Size is really low down there. Let's do this. Now, I like a volunteer if I may, to come and talk at my, talk at me. Come here, you just volunteered. So, so if you could say the enrollment phrase, clearly, ready, go. My voice is my passport, verify me. Close enough, close enough. I mean, it, strangely enough, got a rejection there. So if I said a different phrase, it didn't match. If someone else says the same phrase, we're done, we're done. Yeah. You're free. If someone else says the same phrase, then it's not going to pick it up. And I have tried it where I would record my voice and play it in, and either I didn't do it right, or it actually does ignore recordings. But that was that's a verification. I mean, come on, come on. So the fact that we've now got the ability to potentially, reasonably securely, and quite easily um, use voice as authentication, maybe, if it is uh, you know, as good as it says it is, then in your particular scenario, which you were talking about earlier on, when you do a handover, well, maybe that could be some form of two-factor authentication within your bot. It does a handover, and it says, I just need you to read this. And you kind of hit the microphone and go, my voice is my passport, verify me. It goes, yep. You are who you said you are. Off you go. That's kind of cool. It's like getting rid of the annoying little two-factor auth app that you always need, like Authy and the bot or Google Authenticator. If you could just do it as, oh, this is the thing I have, this is the thing I know, my, what I have is my voice. I thought that's pretty interesting stuff. And the second part, speaker identification. So speaker verification is I'm going to repeat this very short piece of text three times so that you know I'm definitely me via my voice print. Sweet. Speaker identification is a bit more kind of asynchronous. It's I've got five minutes of audio or less, and I want you to analyze this, take out all of the gaps, and create a voice print from that that I can then give you other random bits of audio and you can match against. <laughs> I'm going to need audience participation in a moment, you can tell. So in the example on the website, you've got six enrollment speeches from six presidents, and then play any one of them randomly. And it will kind of say, oh, I think that was Barack Obama talking, because it's matched that profile against this large chunk. 
there's one more step in that. Because you can submit up to like five minutes of content, then it has to be a bit asynchronous. You've got to poll and see, have you finished processing? Have you finished processing? But you only do it once instead of three times. It's very similar stuff. I'm using JavaScript because I'm showing just how incredibly easy we're just pinging an endpoint. And in this case, ah, three things different on this side from the verification one. Can anyone? No, no one's paying attention. It's fine. Um, identification profiles instead of verification in profiles. Identification profile ID instead of verification profile ID. And locale. You can either do US English or um, Chinese, Mandarin. So it's multilingual. At least there's two in there. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be more. But the fact that it's even got Chinese in there for um, voice print identification, very, very cool. You'll get back an ID. Brilliant. Same as before. Create a new profile, get an ID. Now, I would like to give a chunk of audio that could be pretty damn big and say, associate this voice print with this ID. Got rid of the headers. They're in there, but it wouldn't fit on the screen otherwise. Now, instead of getting uh, a A-OK, -okay, everything went well response, you just get back an empty response with a, with a location of this is where you need to keep polling to find out how the processing is going. Get that back. So we're going to poll, 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 poll. And imagine something like this is inside a, I don't know, a set interval or something. And you're just kind of checking until you get a result that is both succeeded and the enrollment status is enrolled. Yay! If you get something back that is succeeded and the remaining enrollment speech time is greater than zero, it means that you need to give a longer piece of audio. That's about it. Anything other than that, it's either failed or it's not done yet, and you kind of either keep checking or give up. You'll get back something that looks a bit like that. So this, in this example, it was definitely 15 seconds of audio that I submitted, but it chops out all the gaps. So you know, anytime you take a breath, anytime you pause, that's just completely pointless. So it'll suck that all down, end up with 13 seconds. It does need a minimum of like 30 seconds unless you pass in a hacky. Short audio equals true, but you're going to end up with probably crappy identification at that point, but I do it because it makes it easier. Then it can go down as low as, I think, one second. So you can imagine that's going to be terrible. But something around 30 seconds is the sweet spot, apparently. And then now that we've got our profile, it's, uh, we've polled, it has succeeded, all good, we can do the identification. Again, very similar stuff, but instead of saying, here is an ID, does this voice print match this ID? It's, here is a load of IDs. Which person has this matching voice print? Again, it could be a long piece of audio if you wanted to, so it's going to be an async thing. You have to keep polling to see how that succeeded. And you'll get back something like this of uh, the person, the profile whose audio matched the one you just gave me is that one. So obviously, we're going to try and see if that works, right? I could do with a couple of volunteers, <coughs> Sam. Uh, volunteers, I'm going to Sam, anyone else? Come on, come on, come up, come up. So we're going to try and get three working profiles um, just by speaking for, hello, I'll do mine. No, actually, you can do yours first. Uh, well, you're, you can say anything. You're talking for about 15 seconds, but there'll be a suggestion up if you can't even say Get close, get close, get close. Ready? No. I'm listening. Just start talking for a few seconds. Maybe read this. If you're seeing things running through your head, who can you call Ghostbusters? An invisible man sleeping in your bed. Oh, who are you going to call Ghostbusters? Yeah. That was enough. Thank you very much. Let's see. Did that work? Okay. We have an ID that... Oh, it's enrolling. There we go. Who was that talking? Keyboard. Keyboard's over here. Sorry. That was... So, just to make it easier. There we go. That was literally 15 seconds that you were talking for, but again, it's like 13 and a half. Yeah. Is what I ended up. Oh, my, right? Yeah. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. This is just a simple example of a uh, very bad pronunciation that will create a lot of chaos in any bot or anything like that. Um, 
how is it go when you start to put the uh, Spanish uh, thing in the middle of it? You know, this is the word. It might actually have a bit of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I don't know. I've never tried it with a voice that's not mine. Thinking, thinking. It's taking a long while, but it's thinking. Oh, okay. <coughs> O-M-A-R. O-M-A-R. Good, good, good. Okay, so that's two of you. I guess I should do me. Oh, damn it. If you're seeing things running through your head, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Um, down the road, that's where I'll always be. Every stop I make, I'll make a new friend. Can't stay for long. I'm moving on and I'm going again. Maybe tomorrow I'll finally settle down. Oh, good. Jeez. I do like the littlest hobo. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, enrolling, enrolling. Okay, that was. Now, let's see if this... You can see how hacky this is, right? Okay, so now we'll try and identify. I guess I'll just use myself for this one. Uh, that all the way down, that all the way up. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Hello, I'm just talking about some rubbish now to see if it can work out who on earth is actually chatting. And did I even press the button? I probably didn't, so I'm going to look like a fool. Okay, try again. No, 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 I did, I did. Working, 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 working. Um, identifying profile. I think Robin was talking. So it's right down there in the bottom of the screen. But the fact is, um, if you, go, uh, you can go to this page, you can put in your own key. Um, this is basically just echoing out console log. But there's other stuff going on there. So you can see the calls that are being made if you open your dev tools. And you'll see the profile IDs all get passed along. And it's like, did this piece of audio match any of these IDs? And if it did, which one? Pretty simple stuff, right? That was, I mean, just a piece of JavaScript. I thought that was pretty cool. So now we've got the capability of submitting a whole chunk of audio to uh, this endpoint and have um, voice prints associated with uh, profile IDs that could be associated with your users. There in, it was a while ago, it was uh, a few years ago, Barclays Wealth used a system similar to this, something that was developed by the company that then built Siri, uh, and it was used for passive customer identification. So when they're on their call, their phone call, to the customer support, just in the background, after 30 seconds, it can give the agent uh, a kind of a, an uh, identification for that user. It's like, they say that they're, they're this person. I've been recording them and analyzing them. And yeah, they, they are that person. And they had like, a, it was, a, I think, a 93% um, uh, success rate with customers, uh, by success being customers saying that it was easy and they say it's accurate. So... It's there as a concept. It could be used in your various things. It seems like an easy thing to hook up as well. I mean, that was crazy easy. Now, there's loads of other stuff in the cognitive services. So I was just showing lots and lots and lots of things. If that seems like it's a bit overwhelming, there's a whole load of stuff that you now need to learn. There's hours of videos that you can go to and view for free and learn all about the various bits of cognitive services. So even down to... I mean, deep learning explained. That's got to be a huge one. But you've also got just using bot framework. If you really don't want to read stuff, then why not watch some videos? And it's all available for free on aischool.microsoft.com. So go and check that one out. You know, I'm sure you've got nothing else to do tomorrow from 9 to 5. So we'll have a look at that. And that's a speaker recognition API. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Thank you for that lone, solitary clap. No, but you don't have a question. You're just throwing. You're just throwing back and forth. No, no one. Awesome. Is that working? I have a question. Okay. Is that? Um, I kind of think that this might actually drive people. Do, oh. do you see people uh, going? This is my voice, and uh, please identify me and hey. try and pee times and just go mad at... Uh, well, I mean... But I suppose there's got to be other ways of just... Yeah, compared to it. using a two-factor authentication app, devs, we're fine with that. Techies, we're fine with that. Yeah. 
non techies not so fun of that. Using something like LastPass or, or, or uh, one password. They're like no brainers. Why on earth would you not use them? I'm amazed that Chrome or Edge haven't got this built in already. When you go to a page with a password field, you don't you can't just kind of right click and say generate random password and remember it for me. Because if you're reusing that same password, that just seems like crazy. You have to do that. So maybe have another thing of put in your password and also, or even don't put in your password, just talk to me. Repeat this phrase. You know that? I suppose the convenience of that is having your voice with you at all times. So yes, the yeah. convenience is having your voice with you. Unless you lose your voice, obviously. Yeah, this seems like a single sign on experience and you share the voice print because. Ah, yeah. Like if you're going to use it from like a doctor's surgery or something like that, you're going to have to be quite an ill patient to want to use it regularly or something. I don't know. But. Um, As a concept, yeah, that's a really good idea. But, but in terms of people it, sharing yeah, personal data, I'm sure there'd be some yeah, issue. Yeah, problem. There. And if, if you've got a cold, you know, and you bring it up and you can't try that. Doctor surgery, I'll just give it a go. That's the point, yeah. If you are calling a doctor surgery because you've lost your voice, then this is rubbish. Yeah. Any more? So, so one thing where this is quite useful is headless devices. They've not covered that. Uh, one scenario where this is actually quite useful is headless devices. So if you're using an IoT device that doesn't have a screen, ah, uh, course, stuff yeah. like this is actually is, is quite useful. Uh, so that's kind of like a, a real-world application. I mean, yeah, all of those other um, speech APIs as well, like the, um, uh, I guess the speech-to-text, which you could then pass down to a uh, in Lewis intent model that goes into a chatbot that figures out everything you wanted to say just by talking to an IoT device. I mean, this is, and then this was something I wanted to try out, like two-factor authentication via uh, Alexa where you try and do something, or Cortana, sorry, uh, where you try and do something, and then it says, hold on, I just need to check that you are who you are. Can you just repeat this phrase? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, you are who you are. Right, let's carry on with your request. Kind of cool. Like, not having to open an app, not having to log in, not having to, it's just there. What the? There's, um, there's performance issues between the two different models. Um, of the speaker recognition versus the, the verification versus the validation set. So you have to be aware when you're using speaker identification, mm. you've got a limited number of profiles that you can store. Uh, and using short audio storage versus long storage as well makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, um, accuracy versus speed. Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure there's some interesting use cases for this. I just want to. There is. You can it. fake the second one out very easy. Um, the first one is actually a really complex model set. That's why it's really difficult to uh, to fake. Ah. Um, but this this tech was originally developed um, with the U.S. military. It's why um, when you see uh, footage of soldiers going through Iraq, they all have uh, microphones on their shoulders, and they have um, uh, translators just trying to have conversations with people around them. And so they can oh, voice cool. print everybody around them and store them, and then it becomes a known collection of identifiers. Interesting. Um, and that's how it was first used. Yeah. Was not aware of that, but that totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay, any more? Are we done? We are done. Thank you. Grab and then we'll have Sam and uh, Chris. I was going to call you Gareth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
I'm still there. Hello. Thanks for sticking around. I've noticed some people have run away. That's fine. You know, they're, they're missing the best one. So, um, last one. I was working at Justy up until recently on the customer help chat bot, which if you've used Justy, and why haven't you if you haven't, uh, and if something goes wrong with your order, which if it hasn't, I'll be very surprised, um, you can go to the customer help section and choose to chat with the customer help bot. And we've done loads of kind of sessions about this, about how we trained it, not we, how they, I'm not we anymore, I'm not there, how, they, how it was trained. Um, and one of the really difficult bits using bot framework is how on earth do you test this thing? Because it was really quite tightly coupled to some things that were hard to abstract, uh, especially from a more complex perspective. So this is the solution that the 
bot dev team and lead QA came up with. I'll leave you with Christian and Sam. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Hey, my name is Christian. Uh, this is Sam. So as it says, I'm the, the dev lead on the Just Eat Customer Care help, help bot. Um, and this is just a, a quick run through of what, what our chatbot is for. So kind of similar to the talk we saw first, it's a customer service scenario. Um, I don't know if any of you have used Just Eat before, but the idea is you order some food, uh, the order gets sent to the restaurant, they send you some food, um, and you have your food and you're very happy. But sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, sometimes the food's running late or you get your order delivered and it's missing something. Um, and currently we have like a fairly big call center of human agents who do things like live chat and telephony and stuff like that to answer all these queries. So one of the things we wanted to do is at the very least to flex some of that contact from the, the call center because obviously as orders go up, uh, we don't want to put more bums on seats in, in the call center because it, um, it's like not really cost effective or space as not really good use of space. And there's also a, a bunch of things that actually a chatbot can do probably a bit better than an agent can. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit as well. So our, our chatbot mainly focuses on things like dealing with customers whose orders were late or was missing something. Um, and it can do the things it can do better than a human agent. It can actually give you some credit back if you've had a problem. It'll just, uh, it'll just say, oh, we, we can give you a bit of compensation for the problems you've had. And I'll just do that, automatically put it in the customer's account. They can use it on their next order. They're gonna be happier. They'll come back and order with us again. Uh, so this is how it's set up. This is probably quite familiar to most of you. Um, so we have our Just Eat native app, the iOS and Android apps. And we, uh, we're using Direct Line, the REST API, for hooking, hooking our bot up to, up to the app. We're not using any other cha channels like Facebook or Slack yet. Uh, but we're sort of looking into that a bit later. And then we're using uh, Lewis for our la language understanding, but I'm sure most of you are as well. Um, and we've sort of separated our bot into two distinct areas. So there, there are what we call principal flows, which are essentially using the dialogue model and they're, they're more interactive and they have all the prompts and stuff like that. And then we also have what we call junior flows, which are just a can response and a call to action. And the idea being we can stub out lots of conversation to gather data on, find out what people want to talk about. And then um, if, it, if enough people talk about it, we'll build a, we'll build a principal flow um, and fully automate the solution rather than just hand them off to the website or something. Um, so in time, that, that actually became quite complex because we started off with no junior flows and like just four principal flows. Um, and it was all really, fairly simple. And a lot of the time, you would just ask you a few questions. It was like a wizard and it would hand you off to an agent. Um, that was all very simple. That was a simpler time for us. Um, and then as, as we added more and more things, we, uh, it became very difficult for us to like manually test. We didn't know what, if a change we were gonna release is just gonna ruin the customer's experience and people are not gonna come back and our project is a uh, basically just a failure. So we wanted, wanted to do a bit more traditional testing, I guess. And as some of you may know, using like the, the .NET bot builder, there's a lot of things that make it difficult to test in a traditional sense. So there's uh, there's not a lot of things behind interfaces. There's a lot of SEAL classes and stuff like that. It makes it quite difficult to uh, quite difficult to just do your sort of regular unit testing. And even where that's not the case, there there's a, there's also a lot of setup uh, that needs to happen in your test to actually be able to test the small bit of functionality you've got. And for us, that was a big challenge for a long time. Um, so I'm going to talk about like our strategy and how we sort of overcome that. We've got some sort of kind of quirky tricks, um, but we, yeah, we've just got thinking about it, like the basic testing pyramid of like unit integration system UI tests. Um, we now have a bunch of unit tests that we can run on demand. We can run by Encrunch, so they're constantly running. So the developers are getting very quick feedback on the changes they make. We have a bunch of integration tests that will go a bit deeper do a sort of whole conversation flow, and they get run every check-in um, and every deployment that we want to do. Uh, and then we have some 
we have not many, but a few system tests that will do a very deep dive into a conversation flow and make sure that the core things that the bot needs to do still work. Uh, and lastly, we, ha we actually have some UI tests that just test their, uh, they test their iOS and Android clients to make sure that the client works in the same way. So then even if we do change things in the bot, the client's gonna be able to handle what, um, what changes are thrown its way. So I'll talk about the, the first two, and then Sam will talk about the, the second two, and we'll do a bit of a, a wrap up after that. Um, so originally, we were only testing the services, and we weren't actually testing any of the bot stuff. So it was essentially just like we completely ignored the fact that we were building a bot, and we were, all we were testing was just our services, things that, and they were mostly just data providers as well, just things going to get order data or customer data, and there wasn't really much value in that. And that was because uh, doing things like regular unit testing was very difficult because you have classes like the dialogue context and they're just really easy, uh, really difficult to mock. And even if you do do that, there's a lot of setup that needs to happen. There's a lot of moving parts in those, in those classes as well. So it, it made you know, tests with massive amounts of setup just for like one line of an assertion. It wasn't really a lot of value. So what we did do was abstract away from that. We pulled all of the conversation flow into its own, uh, their own classes and then left all the bot, bot framework specific class, uh, bot framework specific stuff in dialogue classes. And that meant we had a, like, a really nice separation between the operations were, that were just like sending messages back and forth to the user and then our actual conversation flow. So remember we could rapidly test those things. Whereas before it was a lot of someone getting a phone and literally typing in my orders late, what's going on. Um, and yeah, so that, that was like quite a big breakthrough for us. And then after that, the sort of, we moved on to integration testing because we, um, then we were like, how do we test a whole conversation? Because we can test our individual methods, sort of like uh, we could test a method that lets you choose an order. We could test a method that lets you uh, say your order was late. But how do we make sure that the user has the journey that they're expecting? Um, and, and this is where things started getting really funky because we, we realized we needed to call the bot framework. And that was sort of a, a dependency that when we first started, wasn't that stable. Um, but, and also it, it added a lot of time to the whole testing cycle to making all these calls to the bot framework and to Lewis and then back, back and forth. So what uh, someone in my team did, they had the crazy idea of forking the emulator because obviously it's just an Electron app. Uh, you can go and get the code, it's on GitHub. So we forked the emulator and we put some hooks in it and all of our integration tests now actually just uh, spin up the emulator if it's not running, pipe all the stuff in through the emulator and we no longer have to call the bot framework. So that actually made our testing cycle a lot shorter like by a factor of like 10. Um, and then to actually write our tests to verify that we're getting what we needed, we wrote a, a very lightweight BDD style framework uh, which we'll see a bit of, bit of the code for that now. Uh, well, a bit later on. Um, and then after that, we, we, were sort of, we were quite happy with what we had. We, uh, we were doing our traditional unit testing. We could, we could have essentially like do TDD for a bot, which I, I think was, like, was quite a big achievement for us. Um, and then we could also verify that the customer journeys were happening as well. So the, the product people were happy because we weren't, we weren't going to, they knew that the changes we make were not going to affect their customer too much. We were happy because we felt like we were, you know, being responsible engineers and testing things in the way we should. And then we moved on to, I guess, a lot higher level where we wanted to make sure that everything's working together. We moved on to the system testing that Sam's going to talk about. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can tell this is where the QA guy gets involved. Um, unit tests and uh, integration tests are great. Um, but we just, we just wanted to know that a customer could get all the way through. Um, and as Christian's mentioned, you can, um, you can talk to the bot. And uh, if, you meet a, if you've met a certain sort of set of criteria, um, the bot will be, okay, we can give you a five pound voucher. Um, and then that's sort of deflected that contact. Um, so what we need to be able to do is is test that sort of we can talk to the bot and then the bot can talk to all those other dependencies uh, downstream and make sure that it can, uh, that sort of real orders exist um, and it can give credit for those. Um, so we, 
we you sort of have this layer of system tests and it there's, at the minute i think we've only got three tests um so it's, it's very lightweight um and it'll it'll go through create an order in our staging environments uh, and then um, make sure that the credit can be offered um and then go through the other flows i think there's another flow where we can we can actually cancel an order through the bot as well um so just make sure all of those are working um and yeah like i said they, they, they run our staging environment because um like most people our qa environment can I only deal with our components, but staging has everything on them. Um, and then, yeah, again, as Christian mentioned, the, the UI tests, um, we've used our own, uh, so iOS's tests are all written in Swift, um, and the uh, Android tests are all written in Java. So we've used those frameworks, um, and we've mocked everything. Um, so it's anything that goes to the direct line um, is all mocked out, and then we just make sure that the UIs uh, are getting back the right components. Uh, they're all sort of clickable uh, and everything works that way. And then I think, uh, yeah, this is just a, a sort of a quick code snippet to, to show how we've kind of tried to go down the BDE um, way of writing our tests. Um, so what we're doing here is um, confirming that a previous order was late. Uh, so what that means is someone will come into the bot, so the bot will be, oh, this is your current order. Is that is that what's late? Um, and we, we've actually got the ability to say, no, not that one, another one was late. Um, and then so the, the user will go through, it's late, is this the, the order you're after? No, nope. and then go down and uh, the bot should then say, I believe that order X was late. Um, and then we can use that um, to make sure that um, choosing to speak to someone actually transfers the user. Um, so they'll have gone through all of this, um, confirm that the previous order was late. And then at the bottom, we just expect the transfer options to come back. Has that covered everything? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, So uh, for us, like, the nice thing about this was that um, we, uh, our bot will, for a given, a given utterance that it's going to say back, there's a number of choices that it can pick. So it, uh, so we get a bit of randomness and it feels a bit more human having different things that it can say. So the nice thing about the framework that we built is uh, we can expect the bot to say like any one of those. And we, uh, we can also test things like the, the prompts show the right buttons with the right text. Um, and we can also, it's not quite shown here, but we can also do things like uh, confirm that the bot says the the bot uses something like if a customer tells us an order number, we can confirm that the bot has said the order number back to them and stuff like that. So, sort of taking a bit of templating in it and using using that in our tests as well. Um, and this meant we could like sort of rapidly write um, rapidly write a lot more tests than we could before because before we were spending a lot of time doing setup and stuff like that. Um, in my spare time, we've been trying to write sort of a newer version of this, but. Uh, my first child was born like three months ago, so that's basically in the bit now. Um, yeah, oh, the one thing I did mention that Robin mentioned at the beginning is we, we are hiring for people to come join our bot team. So if you're, if you're interested, you want to work on quite a cool chat bot, uh, come speak to me or Sam, and we'll, um, we'll take some details and to, we'll get back to you by the end of the week, basically. Uh, any questions? No. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. Back here. Um, more beers. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, more beers. I mean, that was basically it. So uh, there should be right at the end after this slide. Where's the clicker? Where's the clicker? There we go. There. Yes. So um, thanks to Justy. This is. Wonderful environment. I love this and great beers and pizza and stuff. Uh, should you have any questions about any of the the stuff? That's right, pictures. Good. Um, they're the people to ask. Um, there probably won't be one of these next month, but I've got some great stuff lined up for January because NDC is happening in January, and there's a few people talking about bot-related stuff who would like to practice it. So we've got um, yeah some good sessions coming up in January, uh, which I'll give more information about afterwards. But that's it. I hope you had fun. There's more beers and there's some pizza that needs to be eaten. So if you'd like to do that, then please do so. There'll be a video. There'll be a video.
There will be, yeah, this has been recorded. It will get edited and I will share the video once it's, uh, once it's finished. And if I can get slides and links and things like that, share all those as well, all via the London Bot Framework Twitter handle. Thank you.